welcome to the CEO Conversation Show here on BizTech Asia. I'm Jason Dacey, and today we have a very special guest from the medical profession in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. It is Dato Dr. Asai Azan Abdul Rahim. He's a cardiologist who practices at the Institute Jantung Negara, the National Heart Hospital in Malaysia. Welcome to the show, Dato. Thank you for having me, Jason. Can you first tell me exactly uh, what IJN does in Malaysia, its specific role? Thank you. So perhaps let me put that in, into perspective. Uh, the National Heart Institute, or IJN as fondly known in, in Malaysia, uh, was uh, the brainchild of uh, Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamad, our then Prime Minister of Malaysia. Uh, this was way back in 1989 when he had his uh, bypass surgery. Uh, he realized that there is a need to have a national cardiac referral center in Malaysia due to the increasing numbers of patients who were suffering from heart disease. So following that, in 1992, uh, the IGN was officially open. Uh, at that point in time, we were a rather small unit. We had 270 beds and about 290 doctors. But fast forward to 2023, we have grown a lot over the last 30 years. Uh, we now have 460 beds and 175 uh, doctors are manning hospital. Now, IJN is unique uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense because although we are a private hospital, we are an entity owned by the government. So this is very different from other private hospitals operating in Malaysia where they are public listed companies. So because we are owned by the government, our priorities in terms of treatment may be slightly different uh, from the other uh, private hospitals in Malaysia. First and foremost, all the doctors and staff in this hospital, they are employees of the hospital. So we are salary employees, uh, whereas those who are in the public hospitals, most of the doctors are service providers for the hospital itself. So they are not uh, the staff, permanent staff of the hospital. So that's a slight difference. And secondly, because we are owned by the government, our top priority is to provide health care in cardiology, uh, which is safe, which is of highest quality at an affordable price. Secondly, our other goal is to be a training center. We are responsible to train not only the doctors, but also the paramedical or allied health. This includes the nurses, the technicians, and other staff in the field of cardiology and uh, thoracic medicine. And thirdly, we're also entrusted to conduct research on cardiovascular disease uh, in Malaysia. So this sets us apart from the other um, uh, private hospitals uh, in Malaysia. That is interesting how it began with uh, Dr. Mahathir's operation, which was very famous back in 1989. I guess that provided some impetus and inspiration for you. Indeed. Yes. So I think uh, I would, I think I would be, you know, uh, happy to say that uh, without that particular incident, perhaps IAGN would not have existed. And you do say that it is private, but you know, serving um, a particular part of society. I understand that the majority of people who use IJN are actually Malaysians, not foreigners. Yes, at the moment, I would say 98 to 99 percent of our clients are Malaysians. Uh, our international patients account for only about one to two percent, but we, we aim uh, to grow that number uh, in the future. And the uniqueness of IJN, you mentioned that there are a lot of uh, private providers that have fluxed, come into Malaysia in the last uh, few years, but you've been there a long time. So talk more about the uniqueness of IJN. So I think the other part was unique about IJN is because we are a standalone cardiovascular and thoracic hospital. Most of the other private hospitals in Malaysia are multi-speciality in nature. So we are somewhat like a, like a boutique hospital, if you, if you want to put it in, in a sense, yeah? focusing on just that narrow spectrum of disease. Uh, but for Malaysia, uh, it is still an important uh, component of disease to tackle because when we look at in terms of our uh, mortality figures, uh, heart disease is still the number one killer uh, in Malaysia. And I think it's also common across uh, countries around the globe as well. So we, we need to focus on uh, heart disease because it is a potentially um, treatable conditions, especially if, if detected early. Uh, so to, for us to be able to do that, we have a whole host of uh, services 
uh, I would say the whole spectrum of services it, from A to Z to be able to treat cardiovascular disease locally to our people here. But we are also open, of course, uh, to patients from other parts of the world who want to enjoy the same quality uh, of uh, services uh, at a very affordable price. Why would you say that Malaysians are so prone to heart disease, Datuk? What, what is it about? Is it the diet? Is it the lifestyle? Uh, well, the, the main reasons for, I think, most Malaysians having heart disease because we have a very high incidence of risk factors for heart disease in this part of the world. Partly, I think, as you correctly pointed out, uh, partly it is diet, partly it is also a lifestyle. So things like obesity, um, smoking, diabetes, uh, the percentage of patients, at least in this part of the world, are still relatively high compared to the others. So these are risk factors for developing uh, heart disease in the future. Now, of course, we've come through a pandemic, very tough times uh, in the medical profession for society in general, and Malaysia was badly hit by the pandemic. How do you look back on uh, 2022 as, uh, you know, as we get into 2023? How do you look back on last year at uh, IJN? So I think last year was a year of transition. We're just coming out from the uh, pandemic, but not yet quite out of the woods yet. Yeah? So it's like an you know, in, in, in between situations. So, but I must say last year was quite uh, you know, significant for us because last year represented our 30th year of operations since we started in 1992. Yeah? So what the pandemic has taught us, it has taught us that we need to do things differently. Yeah? So because of the pandemic, there were multiple challenges. Yeah? Uh, there were travel restrictions, uh, patients were sick, there was uh, a lot of procedures and policies which we had to follow in order to prevent the spread of disease as there was no particular treatment available in the early stages of the disease. Yeah? But this forced us to look at alternative ways of delivering care to our patients. And, and that alternative way is actually through technology. So technology is the enabler of that, that allowed us to continue to be able to manage and, and treat our patients despite the restrictions that have been put in place. What would you say about the state of the healthcare industry, not just you know, when it comes to treating heart disease and you also treat lung disease, but just in general um, throughout uh, Malaysia and Southeast Asia, as far as some of the, the challenges that you're facing coming out of the pandemic and beyond? Yeah, I think the, the major challenges because this part of the world, there's a huge number of population. There's also distance issues because of the, the scale of, the, of the, the countries involved. So I think accessibility is one of the things that has always been brought about, uh, accessibility to healthcare, uh, especially when we're talking about heart disease. Heart disease, time is very important factor in, in whether we are able to treat the patient successfully or not. Yeah? So to, to, to be able to uh, bring the treatment to them as soon as possible is indeed uh, you know, an important uh, criteria. I think the other issue, of course, again, cost. Yeah? So with rising uh, economic and tensions around the world and headwinds, you know, uh, undoubtedly the cost of healthcare is slowly increasing, especially uh, during the pandemic. So um, it is, and not all patients, you know, uh, our clients uh, may be able to, to afford uh, healthcare. Yeah? So this is the other challenge that we have. And especially like for Malaysia, we have a, a dual system of healthcare. There's a public system and also a private system, yeah. Uh, because we are a, we are a, we are a public, uh, you know, biased hospital. So the government is has helped patients a lot. So there's a lot of assistance for patients who want to seek uh, treatment in our IJN for heart disease. And because some hospitals in IJN were also then uh, in sorry in Malaysia, yeah, were then identified as COVID hospitals. So they had to reduce other services. So but these patients still required specific treatment. So during the pandemic, uh, we opened our doors to help hospitals who have been identified as COVID hospitals so that we can receive the patients who have heart disease and we will treat them in our hospital. Now, you mentioned, of course, the connection with Dr. Mahathir, who had a second stint as prime minister. And, you know, mm -hmm. we've seen uh, many political changes in Malaysia over the last few years. How much yeah. does the Ministry of Health uh, work with you in terms of what you're doing at IJM? <laughs> Uh, at the moment, our, our well, the Ministry of Health has board members uh, in our hospital. 
So the oversight by the Ministry of Health is at, at that level. Yeah? But as far as policies are concerned, uh, the Ministry of Health has its own, has its own engagement with uh, professional associations and organisations within the country. Yeah? So we are not directly engaged uh, with the policies and procedures uh, at the Ministry of Health level. What about the standard of healthcare across Malaysia uh, in general? And, you know, we always compared to Singapore. Um, where do you think Malaysian healthcare is compared to Singapore or even Thailand at the moment? I think, well, I think Singapore is easier because it's a smaller, smaller country. So accessibility is not such a big issue as compared to Malaysia. We have East Malaysia, as you know, and West Malaysia. So uh, that is still a challenge. But I believe, because I've been working in the health system for a long time, so over the last many, many years, certainly I think Malaysia uh, has done admirably, I think in terms of uh, providing uh, healthcare to their citizens. Yeah? So no matter where you are, there's always a, a, a government clinic nearby for, for the people to go and seek treatment. And if they're unable to handle it, then of course, it, then it is then uh, uh, transferred to the, to the bigger hospital for, for better care. But if you look in terms of, um, uh, you know, the spending by the government on, on healthcare, uh, in Malaysia, the percentage of GDP on uh, spending on healthcare is still relatively small. It's about 2.5%, 2, 2 I believe. And this is most advanced countries in the West, uh, their spending on health by GDP is at least in the, in the double digits. So, but I would say despite that restriction in terms of how we spend, I think the level of service that the government hospitals provide or the public hospitals provide is still admirable. Uh, the only issue is that because there, there's a huge number of patients seeking help, uh, the, the waiting period can be a bit of a challenge at times. What does that tell you, that figure about 2% of GDP spent on medical services? What does that say exactly? Let's dig a bit deeper with that stat. It is interesting uh, stat. Yes, yes. I think, well, so despite that small percentage, we are providing an, uh, you know, X level of service. Yeah? So it just takes a little bit more extra, I think, if you can just, if, you, if you're able to double up. And indeed, if you look at the previous uh, uh, administration, this was the idea. Uh, the previous Minister of Health uh, wanted to increase over the next 10 years the, the uh, GDP from 2.5% uh, to about 5%. So with additional money and resources put into place, I, we can certainly, I think the Ministry of Health can offer a, a better level of uh, uh, treatment to the citizens. How much do you think the health messages are getting through to average Malaysians? You mentioned that there are still people smoking and bad diets and, and lots of stress and, and bad habits. Do you think that there needs to be a re-education for a lot of Malaysians, especially ones, you know, more at the, at the grassroots level, those without a lot of education? I think we, we are beginning to realize that, especially with the, with the, with the pandemic. Yeah? Because when you look at um, uh, you know, diseases, in the past we were focusing on diseases, but I think now that the trend now is to look towards wellness and health instead. Right? This is the old adage, prevention is better than, than cure. So, so I think a lot more resources should be allocated to, to prevention. Because like it or not, costs are escalating. Yeah? And it will never end. So, to, in order to, to contain uh, the cost, at least at government level, we will need to balance. Uh, we will still need the tertiary centers like IGN because there are still existing patients who require specialized care. But moving forward, we still to also need to focus on uh, wellness and prevention. And mind you, Malaysia is also becoming a graying population. Yeah? So the percentage of people who are above the age of 65 is gradually increasing. Uh, I read somewhere that by 2040 or so, at least 15% of the population will be will be uh, above the age of 65. And with age, uh, a, a lot of medical uh, uh, problems will certainly uh, increase as well. So the focus should be on, um, I think, um, more focus on wellness and health and prevention, yeah? but not losing the capability to be able to treat those who really need them. What about your own personal journey into the medical profession? Um, tell me about that. What inspired you to become a doctor, to become a cardiologist? Well, um, it was my mother, actually. Yeah. So I remember my mother, when I was very young, she always uh, mentioned to me, uh, you must become a, a doctor so you can help people. Yeah. She wanted me to help people. So uh, it's a gift to her. Yeah. As a gift to her, I, 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 I studied and got into university to do, to do my medical degree. 
uh, I studied in University Kebangsaan Malaysia. So I did my undergraduate there. Uh, after graduating, I served with the uh, Ministry of Health hospitals, both in uh, Hospital Kuala Lumpur and also in the rural areas in, in, uh, in Terengganu at that point in time. Uh, I then was evaluating what, what speciality should, should I be looking into. And so I then applied and got into a postgraduate program at uh, my alma mater, University of Kebangsaan Malaysia. So after graduating, I joined the University of Kebangsaan Malaysia uh, in the Department of Medi uh, Medicine as a lecturer in cardiology. And after about two years or so, uh, I was offered a position in the National Heart Institute or IJN, and I've been there since. So I've been here 28 years now in, in Institute Jantung Negara. Yeah? So the Institute Jantung Negara gave me the opportunity uh, to you know, explore my, my, my uh, specialty, and I was able to go to a lot of training, conferences, and also attachment in, in, uh, in uh, uh, other hospitals in the UK and I think this has helped open up my mind and open up my skill set to be able to come back from my training and to help uh, the people here. I'm sure your mother must uh, must have been proud to see you progress so far and you know this I guess is like a mission to you isn't it to try and you know share some of the things that you've learned and, and ensure that Malaysians are living longer lives and are getting over heart disease and avoiding these uh, sorts of problems. Yes, I bless her. <laughs> And what would you say with IGN, IJN, the way that you see a, the organization growing? You know, what's what's in the future, do you think? Well, I in the future, IGN, basically, we need to also expand. We need to keep up with the times. Yeah? And if you're looking at the current trends in, in, in medicine, the trends are all towards digitalization, this digital transformation, especially I think the, the COVID has, has taught us a lesson in, in technology. So... Uh, and so over the next five to 10 years, we have our uh, information system uh, technology transformation. We call it SI and SP. Yeah? So this is a, it's a, it's a five to 10 year horizon uh, because we need to digitize so many aspects of hospital management. It's not just the, the, the clinical aspect, but also the other management, aspect, procurement, uh, pharmacy, uh, imaging. Uh, so it's, it's a work in progress. Yeah? And I must say, uh, we only kick starting it back now because during the pandemic, you know, there was so so many restrictions we couldn't move. So this particular we are re restarting back that uh, that effort. But we expect uh, we are perhaps a little bit behind time, but better late than never, as I say. Yeah? And the quality of cardiologists coming through that you're working with there at IJN, uh, are you impressed with how good the young ones are? Uh, indeed, because. Uh, IGN, I think, was one of the things that, uh, you know, that attracted me to IGN in the first place. Uh, they open the opportunities for you to pursue the specialty that you would like to. Uh, so all our doctors here are given the opportunity to go for, uh, to obtain whatever skill sets that they, that they require. And I think that all doctors, at least in IGN, are sent to the, the, the best centers in, in United Kingdom, in Australia, as well as in the United States. So they, we ask them to go, learn the skills, transfer that technology back when you come back to Malaysia later on after you completed your training. How much are you focusing on the business side of things as well as the medical side at IJN? Oh, I still do clinical work. Yes, yeah, that was what I was trained in. So I still run clinics. So I would say the split is about 50-50 at the moment between managing and seeing patients. Yeah. So it does, you know, um, you know, pull me in different directions uh, at times, but I, I take it um, as a challenge. What do you enjoy the most? Do you enjoy the hands-on clinic, clinical work or do you enjoy trying to plan uh, IJN's future and looking at ways of digitalization and everything else? Yes, I think I, I enjoy both places. I've been a clinician for many, many years. Yeah, So it's something like second nature to me. So when I went to management, so that's like a new challenge. It's, it's a bit different from what I do, but I must confess, uh, the one that gives me greater satisfaction is still to, to treat patients. So when you see a patient come in sick uh, on, on, on a trolley and to, eat, to be able to go home walking without any assistance and smiling, uh, that's the best reward that any, any doctor can have, I think. Yeah? And I guess you've seen major steps from when you started as a cardiologist, you know, decades ago to today yeah. with what's possible. Mm -hmm. I must say technology has advanced significantly in the field of cardiology, when I first started 30 odd years, 
to what I'm seeing now. So in fact, many of the things we were doing 30 years ago, we, we don't do nowadays. Yeah? And how technology has changed, especially in the field of medicine and surgery. Nowadays, the, the number of cases going for surgery is actually coming less and less. Most procedures now can be done percutaneously. That means non-surgically. So in the past, when I was training, if you had a blockage in your heart, the only way was a bypass surgery. And then came the technology of balloons, the technology of stents. So now uh, cardiology has gone beyond the coronaries. We can now also do uh, valve repair, valve implantation without going for surgery. Yeah? So this has made uh, the, uh, the procedure uh, less risky, shorten hospital stay, and I think provide a better quality uh, of life uh, uh, for our patients. Yeah? Uh, but of course, I must confess, all these new technologies come uh, at, at a significant price. Yeah? But I think it is still uh, worth it. We can now able to offer our patients a wider options. Instead of just purely surgical now, we can tell our patients, okay, we have more options for you, which would be your, your, your choice of, of treatment. Is there something that you're most proud of that you've done, um, you know, most satisfied with when you look back on your career? I think what I feel most satisfied with is I've come full circle. When I first joined IJN uh, 28 years ago, I was a very young, you know, doctor with just his postgraduate qualifications. Yeah, but over the the nearly 20 years I've been here, I've been given so much opportunity, and from 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 just a senior registrar when I was joining IJN, so I'm now the the group CEO. So I think that's the best. You know uh, the the best gift that, that you know that I can get in my service career in IJN. And did you ever get the chance to meet Dr. Mahathir, uh, who was the inspiration um, for where you're working? Constantly, he, he is our patient anyway. Yeah, so so when he comes for his uh, uh, routine checkup, we we have a good chat. And uh, what's your impression? That, you know, it's an incredible uh, story and. Uh, a it sample of, of, of how someone can, can recover from a heart operation and live a very long and healthy and successful life. I think, I think the key is that he is he's, he's very, very uh, uh, compliant. That's because he's a doctor himself. Yeah, yeah of course, so yes. He's, he's a good patient, so all the advice, he, he follows strictly. Yeah? So, so when, when I see patients, sometimes when I see that they, they give up hope, I always quote them, why don't why don't you do you look at our, your former prime minister when he has said the same process done done like your, your, yourself and see how it is now so I, I hope that encourages my patients to also aspire to be to be able to 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 be as healthy as as ever uh, as ever uh, as, as the tumahdi well it's been a pleasure speaking to datuk dr azai azan abdul rahim cardiologist practicing at the institute jantung nagara Thanks for being our guest on the uh, CEO Conversations series here on BizTech Asia. It's been a pleasure. It's my pleasure as well. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you so much, sir. We finally got.